All right. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you can see and hear me, just give me just a quick um, thumbs up that I know that everything is all right. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I apologize for the um, short delay. We have some technical problems. Uh, Professor um, Arsenal Rivetso um, is our chair for this session, but unfortunately he has a, a bit of problems connecting, but he will join us um, as soon as possible. Okay. Um, I'm not going to start off with a lot of um, announcements. We're going to kick off with our uh, plenary speaker, um, which is uh, Prof. Ben Erik van Wijk. I will just quickly introduce um, him to you. Then um, Prof. Van Wijk will give the first plenary um, um, talk of this conference. And thereafter, then, then there will be some more introductions. So, um, Prof. Ben Erik van Wijk is a professor at the University of Johannesburg in the Department of Botany and Plant Biotechnology. He is a plant um, taxonomist with a research interest in ethnobotany and economic botany. He has authored a co-authored more than 300 scientific papers, 20 books, including uh, 50 editions and translations, 40 taxonomic revisions, and more than 100 new taxa. In 2013, he was awarded the NRF SAR CHL National Research Chair in Indigenous Plant Use. In 2015, the Saab Gold Medal, and in 2020, the MT Stain Award for Natural Sciences and Technology Research and Excellence by the South African Academy of Science. He was supervised numerous Sorry, he has supervised numerous postgraduate students, many of um, whom received prestigious awards and became professors themselves. He is an editorial member of the South African Journal of Botany, sub editor chief um, of diversity, and regularly reviews manuscripts. These and grant applications. He served on various NRF committees and organized conferences, including three international conferences and 22 annual conferences of the Indigenous Plant Use Forum, of which he has been, of which he has been re-elected annually as chairman since 1996. Um, Prof. Ben-Erik um, welcome to the conference, um, and I think you can continue um, to give your, um, your talk. Uh, that's uh, really a pleasure for me and to share with you some thoughts on on ethnobotany. Um, this, of course, is my passion, my lifelong passion, is the use of plants. And I think that it is often viewed and considered to be somewhat outdated, somewhat uh, old-fashioned. But I want to put arguments today that ethnobotanical research is actually the science of the future because of the relevance of plants to our daily life in all aspects of daily life um, I've, I've divided the lecture into seven parts the first is an introduction then some ideas on methodology then touching on ethical and legal aspects and then the affordances of ethnobotanical research, what, what benefits are generated. And of course, the obvious one is new products and new services, but we also have a powerful cultural component uh, of in arts, design, cuisine, etc. And then we also have the possibility for new innovations and especially because in southern africa we have the most ancient human lineage on earth tremendous cultural diversity combined with botanical diversity and this combination creates endless permutations for new innovations and i think it is as yet relatively poorly explored as i will show you shortly and then some thoughts on the future. The future, I think, is heading in the direction of digital data and high, high volumes of digital data and expert systems and automated mining of data. 
And all of these systems require high quality primary data. And I think we are far from reaching a point where we can say we have complete data on all plants. So there's still, we are only touching the surface, the tip of the iceberg. So let me go to the first slide, real slide, which is a summary basically of my lecture. And I won't stop here. It's only really only the beginning. I will um, just um, uh, go with you through this slide. This slide shows uh, all the different uh, affordances of ethnobotany. Ethnobotany is, is sort of um, at the base of this pyramid, basic science, related to ecology and especially related to taxonomy, because we want to be sure of the species and the uh, chemotypes or whatever that we are working with. And here you can see a summary of all the different aspects uh, of ethnobotany, education, product development, ecotourism, bioeconomy, indigenous cuisine, horticulture, and so on. What makes ethnobotany especially important in Southern African context is the fact that we have this tremendous botanical diversity, which is a, a geographical advantage. And then we have a second cult, uh, geographical advantage, and that is the cultural diversity. So we have many languages, many cultures, but of particular importance is the oldest cultures on earth, namely the sun and the koi especially the sun people who are uh, there's irrefutable genetic evidence that this is the oldest culture on earth and that it is linked to the first modern humans in southern africa in a southern african context also we have the very first ethnobotanical survey that was conducted by simon van der stel um, in 1685, when he undertook a, a, a trip to Namaqua land. So, um, ethnobotany provides all these, what nowadays is referred to as ecosystem services. But I think in the future, and we are talking about the future, the data generated will be used in expert systems and in automated data mining. I will come back to this. Right, so... Um, so the questions posed is, of course, what is, sorry, what is the relevance of ethnobotanical research in the 21st century? Are ancient oral traditional knowledge systems still important in the modern world? I say yes. And I, I summarize it by saying recording, analyzing, interpreting indigenous knowledge for potential uses in art, science, commerce, products and services, ecotourism, and community development. And maybe you can also add the redress. Uh, the importance of traditional knowledge about nature was clearly spelled out in the Shenzhen Declaration. Those of you who attended the International Botanical Conference in Shenzhen in China would know about this uh, declaration, basically how plant sciences can contribute to a green, sustainable and better future for the world. And um, the seven priorities were spelled out. And if you look at priority number six, it says to value, document, and protect indigenous, traditional, and local knowledge about plants and nature. The point was made that it is not only species that can go extinct. Knowledge can also go extinct. Once we have lost knowledge about nature and about plants, we can never regain it again. And in the Southern African context, that's particularly important because we have uh, knowledge potentially dating back to 160,000 years. Uh, and if we lose such information, we lose the accumulative value of experimentation and, and, and uh, random selection for a very, very long period. And furthermore, knowledge is based on unique plants. More than 60% endemism in Southern Africa. In other words, unique plants and their uses. 
and that such information is absolutely for the future of Southern Africa and the world. It's of relevance to the whole world. Because if we want to learn about the history of plant use of humans, we have to come to Southern Africa to look at the sun people and the way they use plants. Right, so um, over the years, there were attempts to stimulate uh, botanical, ethnobotanical research. And this was the vision of some people who started the Indigenous Plant Use Forum. And uh, it, it was really a, a conference that uh, contributed tremendously to, to empowerment and to transformation. Over the years since 1996, uh, I have organized these conferences. Uh, IPAF celebrated 25 years in, 1920, in 2017. And last year we had uh, the conference online and probably this year it will be online again. So this is a very informal academic uh, meeting uh, where everyone is welcome. So we, we have business people and we have traditional healers and we have very interesting people all sharing an interest in the uses of plants. Then perhaps, perhaps just for information, most of you would know about this, but we had a uh, Anna Muteti and I uh, was invited to um, edit a um, special edition of the South African Journal of Botany on ethnobotanical research in sub-Saharan Africa. And there are quite a number of papers presenting original ethnobotanical data. Right, so some thoughts on methodology. I think it is very important to have to, to, to generate high quality data, uh, both quantitative and qualitative, uh, to maximize the opportunities that such data present. Um, in the past, people have just went around with a clipboard and uh, noted the, the plant, plants and their uses without giving any indication of the level of knowledge and the, how many persons, for example, know about the uses of the plants. So quantitative ethnobotany has become uh, the state of the art modern way of doing things. And we have developed also some methodology. Um, one should realize that books in general, like this overview of ethnobotany in Southern Africa, includes general information. It is not the type of information that we really require for uh, academic databases. This is general information. It's usually a summary of information. Whereas specialized information, on the other hand, here we have an example of Wodrangtonia, the Clan William Cedar. And there you can see the summary of information presented in this book. But then, um, my ethnobotanical research in the in the Cedarburg um, is an example of rich information, um, high quality primary data. Um, what I do as a matter of um, routine is to also include Afrikaans, because sometimes uh, subtle nuances are lost if if in translation. So, so it's good to have the original. There are some really funny uh, things that come up. Uh, rural people are often very, very witty. Uh, look, for example, in the middle of the second uh, paragraph on the right. Uh, it says uh, that the timber, because it's so resistant against decay, has been one of the main uses was for coffins. So while you're alive, you have your coffin made. And um, most people in, apparently insisted on six inch nails. In other words, using much bigger nails than is really necessary, just to make sure that, that you stay in your, in your coffin. Um, so such uh, cultural information, I think, is very important for the future because it relates to uh, um, different aspects to arts, to prose, to, to um, history, uh, to, to uh, 
ecotourism, there are many, many applications for some of the, of the information that's presented here. So the, the problem with uh, traditional surveys, ethnobotanical surveys, is that is then, there's no way to identify or recognize false positives because the data is incomplete. So the recommendation is, the international recommendation is, you go for a forest walk. And I think that's utter nonsense. Firstly, there's no forest in the land, And secondly, by walking around, walking around is a very inefficient way to, to collect information because it's not in tropical areas that may be uh, still work, but in a highly seasonal environment, it is ridiculous to think you can walk around and, and find, uh, you know, significant data. Uh, hence the need for a better method, better system. You see, for example, here we have Lacertia frutescens. Um, if you look there, there's, a, there's an open cell under Dorenkloof. Now, I'm absolutely convinced that Lacertia frutescens is used in Dorenkloof, but no one has recorded it. That day when the survey in Dorenkloof was made, uh, someone didn't, uh, no one remembered that Lacertia is actually one of the most important plants. So these false negatives or the possibility of false negatives is really a, a, a problem in, in ethnobotanical research. So it becomes a random collection of in, information. So we have developed the matrix method, which we also call the flip file method. And this is a lot of work. So maybe people don't like this method because it's too much work. But what it involves is first you explore the area and you get to know all or most of the useful plants of the area. And you compile a flip file of photographic plates showing ideally the growth form of the plant and the flowers and the leaves and the fruits, etc. So that any person looking at this should be able to immediately recognize the plant. Um, and then we ask three simple questions. Do you know the plant? Do you have a name for it? Do you have any uses, do you have any uses for it? And then this information is then compiled in a matrix. And so we give one mark for if you know the plant, two if you have a name, three if you have a use. And this in this way, you can calculate two indices, namely the species popularity index. In other words, an indication of how important or how well known that particular plant is in the community. And then you also have, which is unique as far as I know to, to this method, is also an indication of the level of knowledge about the uh, about the local uh, plant uses. So you see here, Jan Baik is the first column. He had an uh, ethnobotanical knowledge index of 0.93. He's the low, he was the late Jan Baik. He was the local Bossy doctor, and he obviously scored very high. Um, this method was used, and this is a, a preliminary summary. I wanted to know um, what are the top 20, uh, top uh, most important medicinal plants of the Cape Herbal system. The Cape Herbal medicine is, is a combination of sun, koi, and uh, European medicine. And it's unique because, especially because of the high endemism, unique species that's not used anywhere else in the world. And you can see here that uh, I use the species popularity index um, to compare several studies in different parts, parts of the Cape region. And this gives a, a much better, a more realistic and objective indication of the top plants. Chinese traditional medicine has 50 essential species. And I'm working in the direction of doing a similar uh, determination for Cape herbal medicine. Ethics and legal aspects. This will become more important in the, in the future for sure. And I think the ethical procedures are important for very many reasons to ensure high quality comparative data. You do a proper job. It's disrespectful, I think, uh, to, 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 to do a poor job 
you, you, it shows you have no respect for the profound knowledge that you get from participants. Then to comply with international protocols and legislation, this is ongoing. To follow the best international practices in terms of ethical behavior. To protect the dignity and intellectual property of rural, often illiterate participants. To empower local communities and develop local research capacity. I wonder how many succeed in that. And also to maximize cultural and socioeconomic benefits of the rich flora and the rich culture. So um, there is a useful guideline that is the Code of Ethics of the International Society for Ethnobiology. You can find it on the web very easily. It's it's old, but it's not dated. The principles are, are, are sort of the same. It, it's not changing much. It's basically common sense decency. That's what it boils down to. And what is especially important is educated prior informed consent. The second last point there before the cutoff. And here we have an example of our um, consent forms that we use as a matter of routine to, uh, to engage with uh, rural participants. Uh, th these forms are translated into the local language where necessary. Um, interviews are only in the participants' own language, mother tongue. So I do not uh, like students who are working in a culture where they have do not know the language and do not know the proper behavior under local circumstances, because that can be sometimes quite complicated. I have some experiences of not knowing what to do, not how to how not to behave or how to behave, because there are certain protocols that one's got to follow. And then collect only high quality data. The data must be publishable to protect the intellectual property of the participants. Make sure every participant is explicitly acknowledged for all use records. Follow up visits are important. The, the feedback. The feedback is perhaps the most important aspect of ethical behavior. People, if you go into a rural area, you do survey, you never go back. People feel, uh, you know, the, they feel offended because you didn't have the decency to come back and report back and say what you have found and so on. So that's very important. So here, for example, we obtained permission from the local chief in a village in Sekukuni land to, to work in the community with Matlatsi um, Mohale, who is a pedi, and he, it is his home area. And so he worked there, but we still had to go through several protocols, including a visit to a queen with, with a chicken as, as preferred present to, to, to get permission to work. Um, here you can see the level of knowledge that's required and the level of documentation to make sure that one can establish prior art. You see, modern legislation in South Africa requires the identification of a, of a community when a particular plant is commercialized. But this is often based on no solid evidence. But by publishing the, the data and, and explicitly citing the participant who has given that information, you can see here, um, that means that prior art is established. And this creates a possibility that rational claims can be made for intellectual property rights. So the publication not only serves as a contribution to the cultural heritage of Southern Africa, but also to ensure that there's, uh, there's actually legal implications here. Then the feedback aspect, uh, yeah, you see examples of feedback. There's a poster you see in the background on the left with a summary of all the main findings. And at the bottom that's hidden behind us, are all the faces of the people that contributed to, to the study. Most uh, K people are uh, tremendously excited to see their photographs in publications. This is unlike the practice in Europe where you're supposed to 
hide your participants, uh, keep them anonymous, which I, I, I think is really not, not a proper way to deal with it. Um, then um, the importance of international treaties. I had some personal experience with this, with the development of, a, of, the, of the, in the discovery phase of the development of a new pasture plant for, for Western Australia. And this was one of the first examples of an international biotrade and bioprospecting permit issued by the Department of Environmental Affairs. And I also attended the launch of the first cultivar that was released. So this plant, uh, Sand, Sandfeld plant, uh, relatively unknown, no real local uses recorded, but it is a very good pasture plant for Western Australia. So now I come to the affordances of ethnobotanical research. In other words, what products one can get, what benefits can be derived from ethnobotanical information. And we can maybe for a moment just consider Africa's contribution to, uh, co uh, Africa's contribution to commercial plant products. That means functional foods, chemical entities, herbs and spices. And I've studied this topic in rather detail. And you can see here, North African aloe vera is arguably the most important of all medicinal plants in the world. Maybe cannabis should be, can also <laughs> soon be uh, overtake aloe vera. Uh, and then Ethiopian coffee is, is uh, next to petroleum, the most valuable natural product in the world. Uh, more than 200 billion US dollars or perhaps even more. Uh, so these uh, coffee is a, a real African product. A summary based on a book that I did with Professor Wink of Germany, of Heidelberg. We made a summary of all the commercialized medicinal plants of the world. Here you can see a summary of it and you can see that the genetically rich north as many, many products developed, whereas the genetically rich South has few products. Africa, not too bad, 83, but it is very clear given the uh, tremendous cultural diversity of Africa, more than 2000 species, about, sorry, more than 2000 languages compared to maybe a hundred in Europe and Asia, that, that uh, Africa, there's a long way to go in terms of exploring and exploiting the full potential of the flora of Africa. Um, I also made a, a comparison at, at uh, continental level of commercialized medicinal plants. And it's clear that the pattern in Africa is different to the overall pattern and different to other continental patterns. So what's unique in Africa is that Fabaceae is the main family that's commercialized in terms of medicine. And the second one is Apocynaceae. And these two um, families are relatively, uh, as a different pattern for the rest. Apocynaceae is generally very minor in the world. And Fabaceae is mostly in tropical parts of the world. So there's still a lot of data to be gathered on African medicinal plants. Products and services. I think we have an opportunity to develop a very sophisticated ecotourism industry. Um, already, we have amongst the we are the one of the countries with the most sophisticated literature on plants. Um, I recently visited uh, Cape Nature in 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 the Mamre area, and I was very very impressed with the enthusiasm amongst the youth for getting to know Feinbos plants and getting to, and they are really inspired. And I, I think perhaps uh, Rupert Koopman has something to do with that, but there's a tremendous uh, uh, interest in Feinbos and a pride in the local Feinbos. Um, so there are, of course, uh, books, uh, many books on plant uses. Uh, some of the ones I wrote. And then, of course, there's also uh, science education, the educational aspect. 
And here is an example of a Teachers Without Borders project uh, by uh, Yusuf De Beer, co-worker. Uh, this is about the incorporation of indigenous knowledge and when it comes to botany, obviously ethnobotany, into the school curriculum. We really, I think the time has passed where we should learn about the pine tree and the and oak trees. Uh, there's much more to learn, much more interesting things. Then also science education. This is an example of Marula products and the requirements. And one of the first requirements of getting international uh, recognition or uh, um, gain access to gain access to international markets is to have a proper ethnobotanical data set. To, to, so that questions about safety and efficacy can be rationally explored. And Marubini Matua has done a study of Marula uh, as a small contribution to a project uh, on Marula by Cyril Lombard and his co-workers. It's a big project, but uh, Marubini uh, played a small part in collecting as much as possible the regional uh, ethnobotanical information about Marula. Now we want to quickly, uh, like just quickly flip through several well-known plants, African plants that has been commercialized. It's a total of 14 and I will just quickly flip through it. There's not much to read. Uh, each, each of these plants has a particular uniqueness to it. And, and I'd like to highlight that. Uh, this, in this case, it's overcoming regulatory barriers to entry to markets. Novel food status in the EU, grass status in the USA, not easily achieved, but uh, thanks to uh, fight trade and, and their people, this was achieved for Africa. A major breakthrough in terms of dietary supplements, uh, functional foods, uh, health bars, etc. Round leaf buchu, um, struggling. Why? No clinical evidence of efficacy. It is such a pity that no one bothered to test um, the urinary tract disinfectant properties of Buchu and to do uh, some basic clinical work on it. And this is hampering the development of Buchu. Cape Allos, uh, a, a, a tremendous potential to replace aloe vera, but as you may know, is recent concerns about the possible carcinogenic effects. So, banning the food use of aloferox, uh, the medicinal use will still be allowed. African wormwood, recently in the news because of COVID, of course, it's very different to Artemisia annua. Uh, you can't just extrapolate from one species to the next because Artemisia afra does not contain that. that uh, bridge uh, in the chemistry that uh, Artemisia annua has. Nevertheless, it's a, a certainly a plant with tremendous potential, commercial potential. And then the rooibos tea, an example, an example of a marketing success story and a recent agreement on access and benefit sharing. Honeybush tea, very exciting. I, I predict a bright future for honeybush if it can be cultivated in, in, in large enough quantities because of the presence of the main compound, mangoferin. Mangoferin has been subjected to clinical studies showing real, real health benefits. So here you have an active ingredient in honeybush. Surprisingly, the main compound in, the main compound in honeybush. And it is uh, really exciting to see the uh, clinical work done on, on mangoferin. So this is a, this is truly a health food, a health product. And then uh, Devil's Claw serves to illustrate the impact of clinical studies. The moment clinical studies were done on um, Devil's Claw, that moment it turned into a major crop and it, a major product worldwide for low back pain, anti-inflammatory. Moodya, perhaps a way not to go. Uh, there's a lot of issues around intellectual property rights, access and benefit sharing. And there was, of course, uh, many, many fraudulent products. So people made a lot of money 
uh, in a, in a, you know, a shameful way. African potato, perhaps also another way not to go. The only reason why most people know about African potato, a name created for commercial reasons, is that uh, it was uh, millions of rand was spent on marketing. And uh, I'd better leave it at that, not to be sued by someone. Cancer bush, Sutherlandia, in my opinion, uh, it's an example of a plant that shows true synergism. It's a fascinating story. It's a long story. I have no time to tell it. But I have no doubt that uh, this plant represents the pharmacology of the future and where people will develop methods and techniques to study synergism. Because that is at the moment a very difficult thing to do. Uh, this is the first, comp uh, uh, first commercial plantation, one of the first commercial plantations, first commercial products that was involved in this, and the first comprehensive safety study on indigenous herb in South Africa. Then a famous Umkaluhabu, Roy Rabas, a German phytomedicine, Umkaluhabu, 80 million euros or more a year, very valuable. Um, also some questions about benefit sharing, etc. Uh, many, many clinical studies showing efficacy against bronchitis. And then Skeletium, uh, a potential blockbuster product for South Africa. You, you can imagine what a herbal Prozac can, it, it, it will run into the billions if this is, can be successfully marketed. The main point is that there's no physical or psychological dependency whatsoever, although it gives you a kick. I was also involved in the first product development and crop development of this plant. Uh, it was re first recorded very explicitly and in detail by Simon van der Stel in 1685, a rare example of early high quality ethnobotanical information. Uh, it's cultivated on a large scale today and there's some uh, very interesting uh, pharmacological studies showing uh, improvements in cognitive function, many interesting developments in, in um, exploring basically brain activity, which is, which is uh, it's said that the brain is one of the last uh, um, frontiers of science, the human brain. Uh, space is a frontier, the human brain is a frontier. I guess the ocean is also a frontier from a biological perspective. Then pepper bark, the idea that for sustainability, not to ring bark the trees, but to use the leaves, which also contain uh, those pepper like uh, pepper tasting substances. And then the last example is burn jelly plant or balsam cupifa, which is topically used against uh, burns and skin problems and mosquito bites. It works very well against each. And yeah, it shows the value of social entrepreneurship. So the development of this product is closely linked to social entrepreneurship and empowering of local communities. I think in Africa, that is the way things will go in future. Okay, then we come to a little bit more of the cultural aspects of ethnobotany. And there's some fascinating things. Just example of uh, origins of names. Uh, you see on the picture on the right, uh, it was known as the mountain of the red bulb. Uh, and this was based on uh, erroneous um, uh, information. So everyone thought that Hintami refers to, uh, that, that Hantam refers to Hintami on the left. Hintami is the generic uh, Nama name for Pelagonian. Nami, Nami, but you see the Nami, the, the, it's not Hantam, Hintam, it's Hintami, it's the Nami, Nami. Uh, so um, the, the Greek equivalent is, uh, of course, Aria, the generic names for Pelagonium. Because the plant grows there, it was thought that this is the origin. More recently, in this wonderful book, fantastic, fascinating book by Raper et al., 
um, they show that Hantam actually comes from Han, han the, the Koi name, the Cape Koi name, word, Han, for fathers, father, fathers, and Ta, for re, reed. So Hanta, Hantam. Hantam means the reed of our forefathers. Uh, that is flaky's reed, of course, very common in the Hantam River. And so the Hantam River, the, the Dutch, early Dutch, when they explored the Cape, had respects for the local uh, uh, names of places and translated them into Dutch. So Hantam then became Vaderlands Ritrefeer, um, uh, which is a direct translation of the original Khoi meaning of the name. So that is just uh, something fascinating. Uh, by the way, Fragmitis is also uh, the Zulu. In the Zulu culture, you have Umklanga. Umklanga refers to the same plant, Flakizri. Then you have numerous um, applications in poetry, symbols, designs, art, literature, cuisine, music. Uh, here is a quick summary. Uh, Burniev, look at all those names, uh, vernacular names that Burniev used, the famous South African poet. Um, the indigenous cuisine, you have waterblomikis, and you have proteas and symbols and designs. And you have, and this one is particularly interesting to me because I am absolutely convinced that uh, Rnoster Bos is the Karoo frankincense. If you remember the picture I showed of the coffee ceremony, Ethiopian coffee ceremony, uh, it's customary to burn incense as part of the coffee ceremony. And in this case, also in the Karoo, uh, Burniev uh, wrote this line in one of his poems, Ek wil reik kan reik as koffie water kook, so strong out koole of a nosterbos rook. So that means that this uh, poet wants to smell the smoke of a noster boss or a noster boss when he drinks his coffee, when he makes his coffee, when he actually when he boils the water in anticipation of the coffee. So this is clearly as a parallel to the use of frankincense in Ethiopia. And furthermore, uh, most many people in the Karoo insist that you should use Frank uh, uh, noster boss timber wood stompies when you make a, a, a rooster cook. A rooster cook is traditional bread made directly on the fire and the rooster boss imparts a, a particular uh, flavor to the rooster cook. So the, here we have the frankincense of the karoo. Symbols and designs. Aloe is very f popular for various reasons. Uh, Californians think this is uh, their plant, but it's a Cape plant that they imported many years ago. Okay, so new innovations. I want to quickly talk about new innovations. And what comes to mind immediately is the unique culture that I mentioned earlier, the sun culture, closely, closely linked to aromatic plants. So do not believe that uh, aromatherapy is a French invention. It is an ancient, ancient African and Southern African custom to use aromatic bushes. And the very name Bushman means, if you directly translate it, it means aromatic bush person. Because son or son is Teronia on a And uh, qua means people. So son qua. And uh, for example, you have in the little guru, quari son. Kwari Buhu. So Buhu and Son or Sun are equivalents or synonyms. And there's very interesting early records of um, this is a man, much underestimated aspect of Southern African plant culture. The use of aromatic plants by the Sun and Koi people for ritual, spiritual and cosmetic purposes and medicinal purposes also. And there are more than 50 different buchu plants, many of them not yet properly explored. 
So there's a lot of work to do still and a lot of possibilities for innovation in terms of new flavors and new fragrances. An example for, uh, uh, once again, Renosterbos, we have recorded in different places in the Kamisberg, in the Little Karoo, in the Groot Karoo of people using a twig of Renosterbos in their shoes to sort out foot odor. And there are very particular bacteria associated with foot odor. And it was found that crude extracts of Letropappus are much, much more powerful in anti uh, much more powerful activity than the active ingredient of foot powder. Significantly, 10 times, more than 10 times uh, or more uh, uh, active against. So there's a very specific antimicrobial activity against food odors, bacteria, coming from uh, traditional knowledge. And certainly it's a matter of time before commerce will take this up and develop natural new deodorants from Renosterbos. Then there's another uh, example of uh, Kurs Pols, a wonderful man from Nivodville, illiterate person with a tremendous knowledge of ancient uh, um, practices. And he told me that old women eat the sweet leaves of apple boss to stay healthy when the cold and flu season comes. And so if you're not careful, you'll miss the part of the old women because we then isolated the sweet compound in this plant. It's tremendously sweet. The roots are sweet and the leaves, you can eat the leaves. They are sweet like sugar. And that, that sweet substance we isolated in the lab and identified it as genistein 8 glycoside which is a phytoestrogen. So it, it, it is clear evidence that this ancient knowledge is profound. You, if you're interested, you can follow YouTube about this wonderful man, Kurs Paulser. It's a, a program called The Professor on YouTube by caretakers. If you Google caretakers and the professor, you'll reach it. And then uh, uh, perhaps one of the most important slides I want to show today is that Sun Ethnobotanical Research, Sun and Koi Ethnobotanical Research created a um, complete new perspective on the use of medicinal plants. It is clear that the original, the original way to use medicinal plants is to eat it, to chew it as a masticatory, to chew the plant, swallow the juice and but keep it in your mouth for a long time and and if you think of that it is a completely different different to swallowing a pill or drinking medicine drinking a herbal tea i am convinced that that in pre-colonial times no tea was made the sun people didn't have pots they didn't boil water water was there to drink not to boil and you eat your medicine when you're out in the field. And I've witnessed this myself. In the Cedarberg study, for example, no less than 28 species are still used, uh, uh, eaten directly as medicine, even today, despite all the cultural influences. So think about it. Uh, in the same way, we, we, as we, we, we do not eat tobacco, we chew tobacco. In other words, the masticatory D idea is that the active substances pass the blood-brain barrier very quickly. So because the mouth is close to the brain and, and the mucous membranes of the mouth can absorb these nitrogen compounds. Then the, secondly, you avoid the hydrolysis, acid hydrolysis in the stomach in this way. And then think about the effects of chewing, really uh, very efficient extraction. And then what about saliva? We know today that there are different genotypes of human saliva. And the role of saliva in healing, the effect on the medicine is completely unknown, completely unstudied. What about the effects of taste? What about pH and so on? So this is a complete new way of study. And I don't think uh, many clinical studies 
have been done where where these medicines, traditional medicines, are taken as masticatories. So then uh, coming to the future, the need for high quality primary data. I think that is what the future is all about. A famous man, Albert Einstein, said in 1926, two mental constructs will direct human thinking in the next millennium, relativity and holism. Now, holism is a concept developed by a famous South African, Jan Smuts. He wrote a book, Holism and Evolution. Few people realize when they use the word holism, they use a word that was created by a South African intellectual. And dualism is the tendency in nature to form holes that are greater than the sum of the parts to creative evolution. So if we want to innovate, we need to consider all the relevant data and all the relevant data need to be available in order to come up with new, with the evolution of new systems or new products. And this is where expert systems will come into the future. And this is where there's definitely a need for big data for lots of data. And so one can view it that all of us as botanists are contributing to one enormous Excel spreadsheet where the columns are run from species number one to species number 300,000 or more. And, uh, and all the different aspects related to that species. Many, many attributes and characters and chemistry and whatever, morphology and so on. And you can imagine that such a matrix is very, very far from complete. And that will become necessary. Now, for classification and identification, the system is near complete in the form of a very, very exciting development. Um, the need for high quality primary data is clear. And the starting point all the plants of the world. And this is a absolutely fantastic development to be able to quickly and easily find the correct name and author citation for all plants of the world. Really an inspiring development, making life much easier for authors and editors. Now then uh, South Africa is unique in the uh, you know, they talk about the fourth industrial revolution and all that. But uh, big data is also used in, for example, the square kilometer array, which South Africans are, are not always aware of that we have this world class um, facility. The final phase will have 197 such telescopes, each generating 25 gigabytes of, of data per second. So you can imagine the implications for, for data management. And this is the way it's going, I'm pretty sure. The same area where the SKA is, is also the area, basically global ground zero for indigenous plant knowledge, because this is the area of the palm or southern sun. The southern sun were uh, some of uh, members of, the, of that, that community in this area, in Katkops, the Swartkop, Strandberg, and so on, were interviewed by Blake and Lloyd in the late 1800s, and they recorded the language. Unfortunately, they did not record much botanical information, ethnobotanical information. But uh, we made a recent study of this area, and we are convinced that the term um, ethnobotanical legacy lives on, at least partly, in the local Khoi people uh, currently inhabiting this part of the world. Fascinating information on the uses of plants. Basically, Karoo type uh, ecosystems. Then I quickly run through a few other cultures. Zulu, Lloyd Mathlongu. Everyone thought Zulu's ethnobotany is sorted out. But look at this, 110 new species records. 1,000 medicinal use records, 560 new vernacular names. I mean, this is newly recorded, obviously. It was, it, it, it's not new, it's ancient, but it's new in the sense that it's not being recorded in the scientific literature. So this is the pattern for all of the studies we have done, is that 
there's still a lot of information that's unrecorded. The, this applies to the Venda Ethnobotany, Katuchelo Magwedi's PhD. Look at the contribution he's made on the far right in terms of the numbers of, of uh, species that, that are used in Venda traditional medicine. Same with Sutu medicine. Uh, although it's well studied and well written up, there's still ongoing basic research to, to, to um, complete the picture. Uh, Klein Karua, Little Karoo, uh, uh, look at that, uh, 4,130 newly recorded use records, medicinal use records, 287 newly recorded vernacular names. Um, Yannicka's study of Namekwa land, uh, 45 new species records, 177 new vernacular names newly recorded, including 105 new Nama names, not previously written. Uh, with this, I also honor these uh, traditional um, bossy doctors of the Macquarie land who are no longer with us. I had the great privilege to meet the bottom three of them. Um, and these are legendary uh, um, and highly, highly intelligent, highly, highly skilled traditional doctors of the Kamisberg uh, that that illiterate people with tremendous knowledge, intellectuals of note. And then uh, food plants, look at this. Fox and Norwood Young, the standard uh, reference work for food plants. They recorded about 800 edible plants for Southern Africa, right up to Malawi. Peters for Sub-Saharan Africa recorded 1,714 species. Ashton Reiter's welcome in her PhD had, had recorded for Southern Africa, for the flora of Southern African region, 1,740. In other words, more than what was recorded for Sub-Saharan Africa and more than double what is included in Fox and Norwood Young. Just emphasizing the need for generating more data. And uh, I'm going over time, but I started late. Hopefully it's not a problem. This is my last slide. I want to uh, end off with a quote of the famous Jan Smits, the man of holism, uh, who said in, 19, in 1944 on a, on a map of Africa was this quote by Jan Smits. And I think it's true even today, although um, the word men may bother some people because that's customary now to say people. So our common task in Africa today is to develop the heritage handed down to us by many people and many nations. This continent, rich in untapped wealth, must be used for the common good if real progress is to be achieved. We can thus make Africa the continent of the future. And I think this is true for ethnobotany and true for botany in general, that these subjects are subjects for the future and not subjects for the past. Thank you very much for listening to me. Interesting talk. Uh, we learned a lot of things from this. Uh, I, I think I might need to switch off my camera because my connection is a bit poor. Probably my, my I may not be very good. I can do the same. Okay, thank you. Uh, we were supposed to have a question and answer session, but I think for the sake of our time, we'll skip that. So thank you very much, Prof, and we wish you the best, and thank you for coming to join us in the conference. So Pleasure. thank you. Moving on with our program, uh, my name is uh, Professor Ozinia Rizzo. Uh, I was supposed to, to, to start, but uh, I had some problems with my connection from this side. I'm in Zimbabwe at the moment. So what we're going to do following our program, I will invite uh, Prof. Glynis Goodman to give a welcoming uh, speech. Uh, just a brief introduction about her. Uh, she's actually the South African uh, Association of Botany, and she's based at the Leeds University. So, Prof, uh, we welcome you. 
And thank you very much for gracing our event. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Ruth Spitzel. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you, ben, Prof. Ben Eric, for a very interesting and thought promoting lecture. That was a great way to start our Saab 2022 conference. Um, it's quite strange to be addressing you all, but not standing on a stage or podium and seeing an audience. Um, but it's lovely to be able to welcome you to the Saab Conference 2022. And we are very grateful to the Mapper King campus of the University of Northwest for hosting this event and enabling us to meet in this way and share our latest research findings. Um, my thanks especially to Dr. Madeleine Strubich and her team. I think it was very brave of them to take on this challenge of hosting the first online Saab event ever. Um, well, not event, conference. We've had our webinars during, during the year, um, but this is on quite a different scale. So thank you so much. Um, we are very, very appreciative that we could have this conference in January, 2022. And well done and thank you to the team who are working behind the scene there and getting us all on the platform. Um, so my thanks then to all of you for, for signing up to participate in the conference. This is an important event in our Saab calendar and it's great to see so many students participating. So students note that your, your student membership was included in your registration fee. And so for this year, you are a member of, of Saab and if you present again next year, that will be the case. But if not, then please continue to, to um, extend your membership. Also, please check out our Facebook page and our Twitter account and start to interact. Um, there are often postgrad and job opportunities on those pages, especially Facebook. Um, so follow it out and check it out regularly. There's also a limited number of of relatively small honors and master's bursaries available for students um, of Saab members. This, these are available on a, an, a completely competitive basis. So you can ask your details or you will become part of the Saab NET community. So you should get email notifications about them. Um, and then for any questions you might have about Saab, please visit the Saab booth. Our, our secretary, Elizabeth Hietz, will be on duty there during any breaks that we have and also during the lunch breaks. Um, so she's got the Saab logo up and I'm hoping you'll be able to get your way around and find her. Um, please also everyone remember to attend the annual general meeting the AGM on Thursday at 10 past three. It's here on the Remo platform. We do need you to take an interest in your society's affairs and participate in our AGM. After that, there will be our awards ceremony. We will be announcing and awarding the very prestigious Saab medals for 2022, and then also the prize winners for the various categories in this conference. So we've had a wonderful start to the conference and I'm sure it's going to be a really interesting week and in that I hope you'll meet some new friends and make some new friends with whom you can share your passion for plants and research. So once again, thank you to the organizers and welcome to all of you. So I'll now hand over to Professor Osmil Rudzvito, um, Director for the School of Biological Sciences on this Mavikin campus and he will be addressing you next. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we are happy actually to have you uh, during this event. And also we are also welcoming your, your council members for this conference. So, uh, Prof has actually welcomed uh, the, the delegates on behalf of the sub. I'm going to do, give a brief welcome on behalf of the university, the Northwest University, and uh, also the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, where the School of Biological Sciences falls in, and also 
for the botan department, Mafkin campus, it also falls in the School of Biological Sciences. So on behalf of the host institution, I would like to specifically welcome all international delegates, all invited uh, keynote and, and plenary speakers, all academics that are present here. I also welcome uh, our doctoral masters and uh, honor students and all other delegates. We are happy to have you here. Uh, I also want to, to, to also recognize the presence and also welcome the organizing committee, as has been mentioned by Prof. Dingley, by Medellin and her team, and also our remote technical team. Uh, we hope that everybody will have a, a, an enjoyable and fruitful week between today and Thursday. We just said that now there will be some hours, so we are all winners. So in brief, I'll actually say let us all feel at home. Thank you very much. So to move on with our program, I will ask uh, Bonello to come over on the podium to help us with uh, some uh, housekeeping rules on this platform that we're using uh, on online so that we know exactly what we'll be doing from today onwards. Thank you very much. And uh, over to you, Bonello. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. So just with regards to a technical uh, perspective, um, just to navigate yourself around. So if you have a look at the currently, you can see the screen in front of you. If you want to um, make the screen, just when you're in presentation mode, if you want to see the, the screen larger, on the top right-hand corner, so you can see it says my name, in the top right-hand corner, there's four arrows shooting outwards. If you press on those four arrows, it will make the screen full screen. Um, and then to get out of that is you, to get out of that, you just press that again and you'll come back down to, um, to this presentation style. On the right-hand side of your screen, you have the chat function, so that's the general chat. If you click next to general chat, there's a little arrow. If you click that little arrow, there you can see table chat as well as private chat. Um, and then you have participants, the participants tab, and then you have the Q&A tab. So in the Q&A tab, you can put all your questions there. Um, you can also upvote a question. Um, so when there is a Q&A session, then we can um, see which other persons, which ones are the most interesting that everybody would like to hear from. When we go into the break, at the top, so above my picture, above my name, you can see it says SAR Parallel Session. So if you click on that, um, there's no events loaded there at the moment. Um, but as soon as the time does kick in, um, that, that is where you'll click to see the links to the um, to the, the, the session. So session two will be in another venue um, and session one. Um, and that is all from my side. So thank you, Prof. Back to you. I think uh, we also need to get some announcements either from the organizing team or the technical team if there are any announcements that we need to get at this point before we proceed with our, our program. Thank you very much. Announcements. Oh, I, missed, I missed what she said on the end. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Prop. Okay, so, okay. so from my side we are now going into a break um just to let everybody know so the sub council meeting will be on whoever is um going to be on that on the zoom uh, the zoom link which was communicated through to everybody who's applicable and then we will go into lunch from 11 to 12 and when we come back, we will go into the two split sessions. Okay, thank you very much.